So Matthew and Luke are the main texts that we go to during Advent, and that's because they focus in on the birth of Christ, that, that event that we are uh, centered in on during these four weeks. Matthew, of course, is concerned with the identification of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. So uh, in, in Matthew, you have his story structured in such a way that he is consistently pulling Old Testament prophecy forward and saying, there it is, there it is, there it is. And, and so he does, he does that same thing. Luke takes a different approach. Luke is a historian. He's writing this book for one person. Right? It says, I'm writing this to Theophilus. I'm writing this to my patron. Uh, and so he is much more interested in getting all of the facts correct. And so he gives us a, a little bit more detail about all the players that are involved in there. So when Matthew doesn't really center in so much on Mary and, and, and Elizabeth and he, it's not because they don't matter, it's because they, not concern, they don't concern his story that he's telling. And so Mark and John, of course, they dismiss with the birth, and it's not because it's not important, but because their audience, right? Mark is writing to uh, Christians in Rome who want to who wanna be encouraged about their Savior, and, and John, of course, is writing far after the others have already been published. And so I don't need to go back to the beginning. That's already been spelled out. So in the gospel accounts, uh, Matthew and Luke are, are where we go. And for the past couple of weeks, we have been resting in Luke because he has that long, long passage there. But today, let's turn back just a couple of page, uh, pages and go to the Gospel of Matthew. We're not going to stay there, so don't move your ribbon. But uh, when you look at Matthew and his birth account, the longest passage, he devotes the most space to that lengthy genealogy that he lays out person by person by person. And he does that because he wants to show the lineage of Christ. He wants to show where Jesus is coming from people-wise and especially that he is this continuation of the house of David. And so he gives name after name after name after name. And, and we've looked at some of the names in there, some, some of the women included in there. So the, the interesting things that we, that we find in there, that all leads up. And then he comes over and he begins to tell the, the, um, the pregnancy and then the birth of Jesus. He's telling this story about Joseph. Of course, uh, Joseph is not expecting uh, this uh, pregnancy in Mary. Mary has been uh, given child by the Holy Spirit. Joseph is a kind person. Joseph is a good man. And so he's not going to embarrass Mary. Uh, but then the angel comes and tells Joseph, everything's okay, uh, Mary is favored of God, and she's going to deliver this child. Now, Joseph is important to the story because he's the one that is a relative of David, and this is how Jesus becomes a part of the house of David. So all of that uh, preemptory story there before the birth of Christ and Matthew points back to Isaiah 7, 14, the young woman will be with child, to identify that coming forward with Mary. Okay? And then, of course, this baby is going to be named Emmanuel. He's going to be named Jesus, but he will be known as Emmanuel, as God with us, as God present among us. Now, in the second chapter, there's a bit of... Um, there's a bit of time compression going on. If we read this quickly, we can think that things are happening one thing after another. And I think Matthew took a little, um, a little poetic license in chapter 2. When the Magi come... Okay, the Magi don't go straight away to the Messiah. 
they have another task before them, and that is they are used by God to get Herod wound up about this baby that's being born. Of course, the Magi come, they've seen a star, the Magi come, what, what are you looking for? We're looking for the one who was born, not who's going to become, right? Who was born the king of the Jews. Now, of course, if you're Herod and you are the current king of the Jews, this is rather disruptive to your reign. This is kind of disturbing to you. And this is where Herod begins to turn. He, he turns murderous now. He's, he's going to go to, uh, to, to no end to find this baby to find this child, the one that's born in his position, uh, and uh, do away with him. And of course, the angels intervene again. Uh, Joseph and Mary and the baby move on. Um, and and that's, that's more of the story that doesn't concern us today. But it's this, this threat, this threat that is a central part of the story. And listen to this. Chapter 2 of Matthew, verse 6, says this. But you, Bethlehem, or Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Now, of course, that's another prophecy. He's quoting the prophet Micah, bringing that forward and saying, look, look, this was told to you who this was. This is where he's going to be born. And so that baby born in Bethlehem, Herod being wound up by the Magi, this collision of all of these things that God has brought about are going to lead... This is the beginning of the story of the cross. That baby born and Herod turning against him. Herod trying to stop this process. And of course, we know because we've read this story that no matter all the worldly conflict that's going to come against him, Jesus, 33 years later, is going to go to the cross. But coming back to the baby and Herod, the fact that he is such a threat right? It brings up another theme that is common amongst a lot of narratives, but especially here in the Christmas narrative, and that's the way that God uses people, and in particular, God uses small people, not small in stature, but small in name, small in fame, small in reputation, God is not going to do what Israel expected him to do. They're watching for this Messiah to come on this horse with all the angels behind him. And everything was going to be okay within 24 to 48 hours. Everything was going to be cool. And yet, what does God do? God brings this little person. Right? And this has happened all throughout Scripture here. God has selected the weak the smallest, the youngest. God picks Gideon amongst the judges. And of course, Gideon tries to wave it off. Gideon says, not me, man. I, I am of the least of the tribes. I'm the young. You don't want to pick me. And God says, but I do pick you. And of course, we know that God works mightily through him. And that's the key to all this. Yeah, God's picking all these small people because he's going to work through them. He's not depending on them to do the job. He's going to work through them. God chose Saul to be king. And of course, he got a little sideways there. But Saul said, I'm not, I'm not it. I'm not it. I'm from the least of the tribes here. God chose David. Right? Remember, remember David, the youngest of Jesse's kids. Right? And Jesse says, look at all my sons here. Here's the, the eldest, the next eldest, the whatever the next would be after that. After no, 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 no. Where's the little one? David is the one that God wanted. And so throughout scripture, you see God choosing the weakest, the least. And he does that so his glory will be on display. And of course, the pinnacle of that theme is this baby born in this backwater town of Bethlehem. 
This baby, this helpless baby, this baby who could no more turn around Israel than you and I could. And so people look at this baby, and yeah, he fills the prophecies. Matthew goes to great lengths to to show that. He says, yeah, yeah, he fills all these prophecies, but he's a baby. And there's a reason that he's given the name Emmanuel. Because where God has worked through all the other people that he's chosen, it's not Gideon's power, it's God working through Gideon and his army. It's not David's power, it's God working through David that gives him the power that he has or the reputation that he has. And it will be God working in Jesus. It will be God actually among us that does all the miraculous things that he does. And that's the theme. That's the theme that leads us up to Advent. We celebrate Christ the Lord coming. We celebrate Christ our Savior, Christ the Messiah coming. And then we sing all these songs about this baby born in Bethlehem. This baby, this innocent baby is the one that is the Messiah and will rise up to show us what it means for the Messiah to walk among us. What it means for our Lord to be present among us. What it means for the Christ to be living and moving among us. And it's the full power of God that we experience, that you and I experience in the Holy Spirit, that we celebrate during this time of Emmanuel. Now we have sung this this hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, each week. And the reason I've split it up over these, these four weeks is that each of these verses addresses a different concern of God's people, specifically Israel, but us as God's people today. So, Marcella, if you would put that up there, we're going to sing verses 1 and 4 as our hymnal has it. And then I'll ask you to stay, re- uh, stay standing for the reading of God's Word. Let's stand. And so we will begin with verse 1. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God word from the prophet Micah chapter 5 verses 2 through 4 but you Bethlehem Ephrathah though you are small among the clans of Judah out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from old from ancient times therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. 
He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. Would you pray with me? Our most gracious God, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the power of your revealed word. Father, we pray for a full uh, uh, feeling of your movement amongst us, your presence on us. We want to know the weight of your glory moving in us. Holy Spirit, awaken us. Soften our hearts to God's word. Let us know the peace that we've sung of and the peace that this passage refers to. Father, remove me from the picture. Let it be your word and your glory on display. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Be seated. Well, Micah is one of the minor prophets, and a number of the prophecies that point to Jesus in life and in death, or I'm sorry, in birth and in death, uh, come from the minor prophets. And they are minor only in stature, in size, compared to the uh, larger prophetic books, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, those types of things. These are just smaller things. And they center in on specific concerns. Micah is unique in that he is a contemporary that is, his prophecy falls into the same time frame as Isaiah. And so we know Isaiah a little better than we do Micah generally. Isaiah is giving a prophecy of doom followed by a prophecy of promise and hope. And Isaiah is giving this doomy message. Is that a word? Doomy? Doomish. Anyway, this, this message of doom, he's giving this because Israel has become largely apostate. They have completely fallen away from God in all but name. They identify as God's people. They would still identify Yahweh as their God, but the law has slipped away from them. Formal legalism has taken its place. And because of that, they've, they've lost their heart. God no longer wants their sacrifices. God says, yeah, don't kill anything else. Don't come near me because I'm not first in your heart. I'm not foremost in your heart. And Israel would say, no, 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 you're our God. Yahweh, you are our God. And God would say, but, but you don't live that way. You don't live that way. You don't demonstrate the way that you live, the way that you treat one another. And especially on God's heart is the way that the rich are treating the poor in Isaiah's time. Much of that prophecy has to do with their apostasy, but out of their apostasy, they're looking at the way the, the rich are gluttons, the rich are these, these fat, happy people, and they are looking down on the poor in their community instead of caring for them. And God is having none of it. And so the first part of Isaiah, the part we really have a hard time getting through, is doom after doom after doom. And yet there's those little glimmers of hope, aren't there? 714, right? The virgin will be with the child. Your eyes brighten up a little bit. Chapter 9, starting in verse 6, right? Unto us a child is born. So there's, there's some hope but it's couched among all that doom. It's only when we get towards the middle of the book or a little bit past the middle of the book that Isaiah says, here's your hope. Here's your promise. This suffering servant, this suffering servant is going to come and set everything right. Your hope is in this suffering servant. Your hope is in that one that's going to be born to the virgin, the, the one uh, that, that the child is going to be born. That's where your hope is. And then God reveals something more there. 
as you get a little further along, this suffering servant is not coming <clears throat> just to live, just to be born. When you get up into the 50s, chapter 50s, the suffering servant is coming to die. And so Isaiah is tempered by reality of what it means to be God's people. God does not look the other way forever. God does not continue to accept praises from those whose hearts are not turned toward him. And yes, he gives great hope. He gives abundant hope. Bless you. But Israel must have been very disturbed as they heard that prophecy. Because God talks about the stump of Jesse. That is, only a remnant of God's people are going to come out of exile. Only a remnant is going to turn their hearts back to God. Well, Micah, as a contemporary of Isaiah, is in the opposite situation where Isaiah is prophesying among the rich, the well-off, the well-fed. Micah is prophesying amongst the poor. He's prophesying amongst the people that Isaiah is prophesying against. And so the two go hand in hand, God speaking this and God speaking that. And Micah, on a smaller scale, doom, promise, doom, promise. And here, as we get to verse 5, he's giving this great promise that Matthew borrowed from, that Matthew pulled forward in chapter 2 and verse 6. He pulls from Matthew, or Matthew Micah, chapter 5. And verse 2 begins like this, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come, watch this, for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. We were singing last week, O Little Town of Bethlehem. There's a reason that song is O Little Town of Bethlehem, because it is a nothingville. It is this tiny little backwater outside of Jerusalem. And I think God shows this. I don't know this, but I think he did because everybody in Jerusalem was looking for the king to arrive there. You would arrive at the most powerful place. You wouldn't start off in some little tiny town off somewhere, nowhereville. And yet God says, watch this. The king of kings is arriving in this tiny town. And we sing this song, Bethlehem, a little town of Bethlehem. The city of bread is the literal translation of that. But there's so much more. Bethlehem, if, if you read your Old Testament, is a very important city. You remember when we preached out of Ruth, Elimelech and Naomi come from Bethlehem. Jesse one who's going to give birth to David. Well, he's not going to birth David. He's going to be David's dad. Comes from there. And it's here in Bethlehem. And this is what ties your Christmas story together. David is anointed king in Bethlehem. And so we sing of this little town like it's this cute little town off nowhere. But God sees this tiny town is much more powerful and important than we do. And so out of you will come for me. Look at that. The Savior is coming for God. Jesus is coming for God's glory. One who will be ruler over Israel forever, whose origins are from old. He's pointing forward, of course, to Jesus. There's, there's no disputing this. But the link to David is what we're interested in because God's made a covenant with David that someone from his family, someone of his descendants would reign forever on the throne. And so this one that's born in Bethlehem, this one that's going to come, whose origins are from old, 
who has existed beyond Bethlehem itself, this one is going to ascend that throne of David and reign forever. And so Micah prophesies this, verse 3, Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son. Not abandoned in terms of God will turn his back. But he's not going to do anything. He's not going to do anything until he acts on this one, the young woman who will be with child. And the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. It's only at that time that God is going to move. Now, if you're telling this to a a group of people who are in dire circumstances, you're going to split that group up. Some of these people want God to act right now. And I can't wait for that, God. I need you to fix this problem now. And God says, I'll do it in my own time. When you see that happen, when that young woman is with child, that's how you'll know that I'm acting. And so God is testing these people that trust in him. God is saying, you trust me. Trust me all the way. Have patience. I told you I'm going to address this. I told you that the Messiah is going to come. I told you how. I told you where. Now just be patient until it comes. Now if you're in dire circumstances, you are going to be challenged. But it's like everything else in Scripture. Has God been faithful in all the other things that he's promised? And if you're Micah's contemporaries, you have to say, yes, he has. Has God done what he said he would do? Yes, he has. Has God rescued us before? Yes, he has. Did God provide for us in the desert? Yes, he did. Has he saved us there? Yes. Did he save us here? Yes. On and on and on and on and on. So when God says through the prophet, be patient, your patience is not just gritting your teeth and waiting. Your patience is God promised it. I know it's going to come to pass. Even if it doesn't come to pass in my lifetime, that's fine. Even if I have to continue to suffer, even if if my life for the rest of my days is the hardest thing ever, fine. Because God said he will do this. In verse 4, he talks about this one that's going to come. He will stand, this baby that's going to be born, he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely. This is the promise. This is what they're looking for. This is the peace that we were just singing about a little bit ago. This is the peace that they're looking forward to. More than than driving Rome out. More than anything else. Remember that that when, when Micah is prophesying this, Rome is nothing. That's a current idea when when Jesus is born. All they want is for God to be among them again. That is the longing of Israel on page after page. All we want is to know God's presence among us once again. And whatever it takes and however long we have to wait, that's what we desire And so, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. The kingdom of David will be eternal. Or the throne of David, excuse me, will be eternal. And we'll know peace to the ends of the earth. And how's it going to come? He will be our peace. So it's it's no mystery why Matthew took this and pulled it forward into his gospel and said, it's happening. It's happening in this baby born in Bethlehem. The king of kings promised through the prophet Micah is here. And peace will follow with him. 
Such a big promise. Such an enormous promise. And, and really, when you look at our world, what a timely promise. Is there anything else that we would rather have in this life and in this world than peace? And I think that God uses these small things, small people, small places, to focus our vision. This, this Savior coming from Bethlehem was for sure countercultural in the time that it happens, in the time that it's, that it's prophesied. They're expecting this mighty warrior king, and instead they get the baby king. They knew he would come, and yet they're looking for him in the powerful places. You have two different things going on there. Their vision, Israel's vision, is clouded. And despite what the scriptures taught and prophesied and and all the stuff they had in their history of God working, they still couldn't see it. It kept the people from seeing the miracle that was Christ. And this can happen to you and I as well. We can struggle from this same thing. We can have our vision shaped. That is the way that we think God is going to work. We can have it shaped by a number of things. We can, of course, the best thing would be to be shaped by God's word. But we have a lot of cultural things that can shape our vision as well that can cause us to look for God to answer prayer, to do something in a certain way. And we end up in the same way as Israel with clouded vision and we're praying for God to do this over here, this mighty miraculous thing over here, only to miss the fact that God is at work over here in a much more subtle way. And so if there's anything that this season can add add to our, our spiritual quiver, to the tools that we have, it's for us to see this this unimaginable, this this incredible fullness of God's presence in small places, in small things. We pray regularly, you know, for the for the fullness of God's glory to descend on us in this room. Wouldn't you be sorry if God answered that? I mean, if the fullness of God's glory came to rest on us, we would be consumed. And yet, the Holy Spirit in each of us, mediating Christ for each one of us, delivers that presence to us exactly the way that each one of us can understand, that each one of us can can, um, process, that each one of us can do something with. And God works in those small ways God works through those small people, places, the small way that the Spirit speaks to you. He uses the small and the weak things so that in every instance, God gets the glory and not us. So that the Holy Spirit reminds you that it is God at work, that it is God that answered your prayer, that it is God that brought, has brought this, this miracle into your life. The small things can never boast. The weak things can never boast, can never say, I did that. Now, the small things can only say, God did this through me. And so imagine if we did that. Imagine if you and I surrendered. If we surrendered our, our, our own ideas, our own notions of how God should do things and how God should make things come to pass. Imagine if we, if we set those aside, what God could do. He could use our lives in a completely different way. God could use our lives in this, in this new way if we committed to his glory as the primary goal. So God, I'm weak, I'm powerless, you work through me instead of, hey God, I'm gonna do this on your behalf and you should appreciate it. Imagine if, if we could surrender, if we could soften our hearts, our, our ideas to such a degree that God could intervene 
He can intervene amongst the weakest of us. If God could intervene in situations just right around us, in such a way that you and I might not be comfortable, but he could work through us to touch others' lives. Imagine if we surrendered our ideas of how God could work and we committed ourselves to being uh, much more Berean in looking at the scripture. We committed ourselves in testing God's word and speaking among, uh, about it amongst ourselves, testing it with each other. One of the things we might discover is that God is already at work. That God has already said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm taking care of what you're praying for. It's kind of amazing the way God works through the small and the weak things. Emmanuel, this thing that Mike is pointing to here. That's the promise of the season, God with us. Do you see it in your life? Do you do you want more of God's presence in your life? It may be that you and I don't need to become any more intellectual about the question. I think we can all process that intellectually. It's perhaps that what we need to do is trust that it's true. Believe that it's true and then move in that promise. One of the things I believe is true for every one of you as believers, all the power, all the confidence, all the life change, everything that you could ever want from God is there to be received. God has already promised that he'll do it. The only thing we need to do as his people is trust it. Turn to it even even in the most testing of times. And always, always, always give God the glory for what he does through weak vessels like us. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.